Our next speaker is uh, Ruben Munoz. Uh, Ruben joined the Golf Organization for Research and Development Board in uh, January 2017. He's the head of the civil group and he's involved in the Global Sustainability Assessment System, GSAS certification through the Construction Projects Life, Design, Construction, Management and Operations. And he's currently the project manager for Expo 2023 GSAS EcoLeaf certification for events and festivals. He holds a Master of Science in Civil Engineering from uh, Madrid University and he has 23 years experience in construction management uh, as both contractor and project management and construction management in Spain and Qatar. Uh, he's been involved in a wide range of projects, highways, roads, infrastructures, landscape and bridges and malls. He's a passionate supporter of sustainability principles in construction activities, emphasizing on the implementation of good waste management practices to promote uh, the circular economy. Uh, so it gives me a great pleasure to welcome Mr. Ruben Munoz. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, for attending this event. Thank you very much for the NPH for having me as a keynote speaker. My name is Ruben Munoz. I am the head of the uh, civil group in GORD, the Gulf Organization for Research and Development. I'm going to talk to you today about how sustainability certifications can serve as a catalyst for inner cities. So, um, first, I'm going to give you an introduction about GORD, about who we are, and what is it that we do. You will see that we are very busy people, we do a lot of things. Uh, then we'll have a look at what is the, that thing that we do to make linear cities, and that is the GSAS, the Global Sustainability Assessment System. Uh, we will see how we do that. We'll have a look at some of those criteria of assessment that are more related to vegetation. And uh, finally, not only we uh, assess and certify projects, but we also provide guidance for them for implementation, and one of them is the Encyclopedia of Native and Non-Native Plants in Eastern Arabia. Oops, went too far. Okay, so board, we are members of the uh, Qatar EDR Real Estate Company. Uh, we are a non-profit organization, started in 2009 in QSTP, that's the Qatar Science and Technology Park. This beautiful building here that is located in the Education City. You're most welcome to visit us anytime you want. Uh, we have five centers of excellence, okay, we have uh, Jesus Trust, which is the one providing the uh, sustainability certification. We have Gord Institute, which is our research uh, center, developing uh, sustainability, uh, sustainable uh, construction materials. And among them there is this project that is taking the brine, as Dr. Dima said, and is turning that into plaster, okay, so this is one of the very interesting ways to get rid of the brine and make a more sustainable construction material. We have also the Gord Academy, engaged in knowledge dissemination. We have Gord Advisory, who provides consulting services in sustainability. And we have also the Gord Labs, uh, which uh, provides uh, efficiency testing for uh, electrical appliances. We have also two affiliates. One is the Global Carbon Council, which is the first voluntary carbon market in the MENA region. And we also have the Global Accreditation Bureau for certification bodies. Uh, we have collaboration with several United Nations agencies. One of them is with uh, UNEP on carbon neutrality for organizations. Another collaboration is with UNEP and the UNFCCC and the ICAO in developing the GET, the Green Event Tool. And that's uh, a tool used for the United Nations events to be carbon neutral. We have collaborations also with UNESCO, with the World Bank. And the uh, board is also leading the official Association of Energy Engineers uh, Qatar chapter that uh, provides capacity building in the, the field of energy. And the board is also chairing the uh, GSO, that's the GCC Standardization Organization uh, on the Te Technical Committee of Green Buildings. So you see, very busy people. This is what we do. But we're going to focus today on what Jesus taught us. Okay? So maybe Jesus rings a bell to you when uh, maybe you heard about the stadiums in the FIFA World Cup 
and they were GSS certified. Okay, so you must be thinking maybe so this GSS thing is it like Bead or Brian? And the answer is uh, yes and uh, no. Yes, because it is a sustainability assessment system, so we provide certification and the built environment. And uh, no, it's not like them, it's better because it uh, addresses the challenges that we have in the MIA region because of our climate. Okay, so for us, for example, water conservation is much more important than it is for lead or green. Okay? Um, so the purpose of this ass is to have, uh, to create a sustainable built environment, okay? And this is goes throughout the, uh, the life cycle of, of, a, of a project, of a construction project. So first we have the design of a project, okay? And for that we have one certification that we call GSS Design and Build. So we receive the design of the project, we have a look at it, we have very uh, 55 criteria, we look at and assess how sustainable they are, we measure it, and we give them a certificate, a provisional one, because then, after the construction is done, we come back and check that the construction is actually aligned with the design that we received. We treat here that are necessary and we provide a final certification. During construction also, we have a different type of certification, Jesus CM, Jesus Construction Management, and we look into the construction practices of the contractor. Okay, I'm talking here about dust control, noise pollution, waste management, soil contamination, energy and water conservation. Okay, total of 25 criteria, all during the construction. So if they are green, also we give them another certificate. And it wouldn't make any sense whatsoever to have a green design of a building. Okay, that it was uh, built in a sustainable way if it is operated throughout the life, not in a sustainable way. So for that we have Jesus Operations that can serve obviously also for existing buildings and we make sure that they're being operated using the sustainable features of the design of the building. So how does this make uh, greener cities? We have some of, the, some of the schemes that we have because we have different, uh, different uh, building projects. Uh, some of them are very much related to cities like districts. We have one that assesses the district, so we have a full district and we assess how sustainable the district is, okay? We have parts also to assess how sustainable the parts are, and the rest of them are buildings which are part of the cities, so the, the greener and more sustainable those buildings are, the greener the cities. Um, so we have different types of uh, buildings, commercial, education, hospitality, residential, and we tweak the system here and there, we give more importance to some criteria than others, some of them even not, not applicable, you know, to have it catered for uh, whatever project it is. Okay. We have also the, uh, another different uh, system, that's the Ecolith, which is uh, to assess, the, the purpose is to assess expos and festival sites. Currently, the Expo 2023 is uh, seeking to obtain Ecolith certification. Okay, and in this case, it's an expo, it's a temporary facility, so we have to look into the design and the, uh, the sustainability of the construction, the operations, and finally the dismantling and legacy, because it's obviously a temporary facility. So that's it, right? We have a sustainability certification system, so let's implement it. We just go to the developers and tell them, hey, here is the system, why did you implement it in your building or in your city, right? And they come to us saying, uh, what, excuse me? And they don't, okay? So we're facing some challenges, some are technical, like of know-how. Some are social, they don't care, and they're not aware of how important it is. Uh, some are financial, and some are legislative. I'm gonna focus on these two today. So for the financial perspective, for example, there is a huge gap, okay, in the perception of the actual cost increases of building sustainably, I mean, the perceived ones and the actual ones. There is a huge gap there that we need to bridge. Uh, also, there are lack of incentives for builders, or there is lack of regulations, and so on. So these challenges, how do we, how do we tackle them? Okay, this graph here shows you, in percentage, what is the extra cost of a sustainable building, let's say. Okay, and how that is evolving a long time. So you see that trend is that it's descended, okay, it's going down, and most of the projects are between 0, 3, 4% of extra cost, which is not very much. Okay, but once the building is constructed and is going to be operated, the decrease in the operating cost is 13%. It shouldn't be a big surprise. If you have an energy efficient building, you're going to spend less money in electricity. 
And if you have a water efficient building, you're going to you know, spend less money in water. No big surprise. Um, the building uh, value increases in around 10%. Um, I'll tell you a story here that happened to me. I'm from Spain. I go to Spain in summer, okay? And I was visiting some friends at this very nice touristic city in the, in the southeast of Spain, in the Mediterranean. And uh, they invited us over for a, for a nice terrace in a park, okay? There were a lot of retail, uh, a lot of restaurants. We were having a nice paella and seafood and uh, so on. My mouth is watering at the moment, sorry. And, uh, and uh, it happened that the area was a lower class area. And the local authorities had a brilliant idea, let's build a park in the middle. That's all they did. They just built a park, okay? In attractive business and everything, the value of the property is more than doubled. Just because of this, more than doubled. So those people, many of them, they just sold their apartments, okay, and got a huge amount of money. There is also a 10% of improvement in return of investment, a 6% increase in occupancy, and 6% increase in rent. So basically that means that you have more people that want to live in your building, and they're willing to pay more money. So again, it's more, uh, the investment is, uh, I mean, it's very clear, right? So this should be enough to convince the developers, right? But it's not. Okay, they still don't see it. Because here it is when we face what I like to call the human entropy. Okay, uh, you're familiar with the entropy principle, right? This is a natural system left unchecked, tends to increase the disorder over time. We humans also tend to decrease the disorder through uh, minimal effort, or in this case, minimal cost. Okay, and apart from that, you need to add that we are short sighted usually, so the parents, the parents just see. This is the cost of my building, it's going to cost me this much. That's it. That's what they see. So, how do we solve this? Through regulations and incentives. Okay? This is part of seven regulations here in Qatar. This one's here. Um, have a look at number two. This one is the Qatar Construction Specifications, QCS 2014. There is one section for this as, okay, for green buildings. And some of the requirements, not all of them, some of them have been made mandatory for green buildings. All right. We have also number three, uh, Qatar National Climate Change Action Plan 2030, that mentions GSAS as the tool to reduce for the reduction of uh, carbon emissions from the built environment. So we have now many entities, many uh, public entities like this one here, that have made GSAS either mandatory or with some incentives for the developers. Brussel City had made mandatory for all their buildings to have a minimum two-star uh, two uh, GCS Design and Build certification. And for every star that they add to that, they have 5% extra floor area ratio. So again, incentive for the developers, more money. So we have many projects here in Brussels that they go for four stars. Four stars is a pretty impressive, pretty strong uh, uh, sustainability rating. And they get 10% extra ratio uh, build. Uh, for the FIFA World Cup, it was mandatory by FIFA, okay, they chose Jesus, and to have four stars minimum, and some of the uh, cities, they even got five stars. Um, we have all the metro stations, also Jesus certified. We have Ashgal, that's the uh, public uh, works authority here in Qatar, and now they have made mandatory to, for all the new government buildings to be at least three stars certified. And now even Jesus Construction Management have been, have been made mandatory. Uh, we have the Ministry of Interior, Qatar Foundation, uh, we have Manatec, the Qatar Economic Zone, all of their industrial cities, all of those districts are GISA certified. And now the buildings in also said they need to be certified with three stars at least. We have also Macor, Haman International Airport, Qatar Museums, and Qatar University, all buildings must be four stars, and even some of them, GISA operations, we don't, uh, call, we don't rate them with stars, but with shiny stuff that ranges from bronze to diamond and uh, some of them need to be gold or platinum. Um, so does it work? All these regulations and incentives and so on? Uh, well, we have more than 2,000 registered projects already with us. Some of them are already certified, obviously. Many of them, in fact. And that comes up to 2.4 million square feet of built environment that is certified. As for the cities, we have the GSAS districts over 1.5 billion square feet including the Lucille City, which will be hosting two, more than 200,000 uh, people. 
and its range is a total of 38 square kilometers. We have also Alcarana Special Economic Zone, the size of it is half Paris, okay, massive. And the Kitai Farai North, just to name a few. And when it comes down to parts, for example, we have over 25 million square feet, including this photo here shows Qatar Hills. So we do have a river in Qatar, you see? And the Panda Visitor Center Experience, for example, in Yonkor, and the Yuda Hasu, just to name a few of them. Okay, so how does this work? How do you manage to measure the sustainability of uh, all buildings, okay? So this is how it works. We assess 55 different criteria that are sorted out in eight categories as well. Urban connectivity, site, energy, water, materials, outdoor environment in the case of parks and district, it's indoor environment in the case of buildings, uh, cultural and economic zone, and management and operations. So each one of those 55 criteria has a different weight. Not all of them are of the same importance. And uh, so we assess if the project is uh, uh, complying with the Jesus requirements for each one of those, every, one, uh, every uh, criteria, and we're working with a level of minus one, two, three. So minus one meaning that they get a negative score if either they don't care about that criteria and don't target it, or if they do, but they fail to comply with some minimum requirements. And uh, so that level multiplies the weight of the criteria, you will have the, the score for that criteria, you sum the 55 of them, and you will come up with a number that ranges from minus one to three. And depending on that, those numbers, if the score is less than zero, it's negative, certification is denied, alas, MAFI certification. If it goes from zero to 0.5, you will get one star, two, three, four, up to six. No project still has got six stars, okay? <sighs> Yet. We're that tough. And at the end, we'll give them a very nice flag where they can showcase, they put it in the lobby or wherever, and they see, tell everybody how sustainable they are. Okay, so we have proved that those, those projects are sustainable, okay? But uh, you must be wondering how green they are. I mean, this is about green cities, this is an AIP achievement, this is about greenery, okay? So how green are they? Okay, don't panic. All these highlighted criteria, all of them have an impact on vegetation, and that accounts for 42% of the total weight of our system, which means that if a building is certified by us, if it is sustainable, it means that it's green as well. It comes hand in hand. You cannot have one without the other. Uh, some, of these, uh, some of these criteria, they have a direct impact on vegetation, like for example, uh, land preservation here, biodiversity preservation, of oh, vegetation, pretty obvious. Uh, some of them have an indirect impact, like for example, heat island effect. I mean, the larger is your landscape area, the more the greater the score that you're going to get in this uh, criterion. And shading, for example, the more trees that you have in your project, the more uh, the greater the score that you're going to get also in uh, in shading. Other other of the criteria, what they do is they support the necessary infrastructure for greenery, like uh, water conservation or rainwater runoff. All those projects that seek to get the scoring rainwater runoff, they must collect the rainfall on their sites, treat it, and then reuse it for irrigation. And others that we have just made the vegetation more sustainable, uh, like waste management, which increases the composting, and landscape uh, maintenance plan. So let's have a look, quick look at some of those uh, criteria to see how it works, all those that have a greater impact on vegetation. So the first would be vegetation. Uh, so we aim, uh, aim to maximize the vegetated area. All right. So let me tell you something. In GSAS, we are a performance-based uh, certification system, which means that everything that can be measured is measured here. Okay. Huge majority of our criteria, all of them, uh, have some performance indicators and some uh, have some benchmarks, and the label is awarded according to those. So for that, we use calculators like this one. Let's see for a little bit how it works. So the project will be input here. The, in this case, the site area in square meters, and here data of the greenery, the species, the growth form, plant activity, quantity, and area cover. And the calculator will compute some performance indicators. In this case. Oh, the first one would be, sorry, uh, percentage of vegetated area, the larger the better. 
The percentage of native or adaptive plants, again, the larger the better, because uh, it's not only about maximizing the vegetation. If you look around you, it doesn't look like it because you're in Alvida Park, it looks flushing green, okay, but we actually live in the desert. If you zoom out in Google Maps, you will see it. We live in the desert, okay? So we need to minimize the irrigation. And we do it through encouraging native and adaptive species and minimizing the lawn area, which is the third uh, performance indicator. So a combination of them will determine the criterion level for the project in this particular criterion. Uh, I have brought you here some examples. These are some examples of buildings. These are the stadiums for the FIFA World Cup. Absolutely all of them have a landscape area. All of them. A range between 9 and 15% of the present. Uh, lawn area to be minimized, so in this case, uh, Lucille Stadium, they minimize it so much that they don't have any lawn whatsoever. Nothing. Zero percent. Mafia grass. And uh, we have also an uh, area with native species to be maximized. In the case of Alphamama Stadium, it's starting 95% of the area with native species. There are two examples here. This is Alcor State, uh, sorry, Alpine Stadium in Alcor. This is where Qatar qualified yesterday. So my group to those that are supporting. And they have a very nice, uh, a very nice, enjoyable uh, park all around it. This is Al Janoub Stadium in Alhuaca. This is an aerial view where you can see also that there is a very nice um, park that you can enjoy. Uh, more examples, uh, cities, Lucelle City. Uh, all these colorful highlighted area, all of them are landscape works. Okay, so the vegetated area amounts up to 1.7 million square meters. And to give you some examples, this is the Crescent Park, which is this area here. It's a crescent moon-shaped uh, uh, park, and it's already built, it looks like this now. We have the Marina Promenades, also built more than four kilometers of promenade with vegetation at the marina area here, also very nice to walk and run and cycle. And we have two large uh, uh, residential areas here. Those are the Fox Hills, still not finished, but once they're done, it will look as gorgeous as this. You see, green seeds. Another example, the Ketaifan Island North. Okay, this one here is an island, and you see it's split in half by this canal of seawater, and there is going to be a linear park all along it that's going to look like this. So this one is still under construction. Okay, uh, another criterion is land preservation. This can be measured, yes, so we have a calculator, it is measured. And the purpose here is to enhance the ecological value of the development site. So we encourage our projects to, to, to be built on areas that have low ecological value, okay, and for them to increase that ecological value. So they do it through remediation, conservation, and restoration. And how do we measure this? Uh, well, uh, first the project needs to enter the areas of the pre-development before they come. Uh, and it's sorted by contaminated land, previously developed, no value, low, moderate, or high value areas. Then they have to do the same thing of the post development, okay? So there is some improvement, there is a weighting factor, and the combination of those uh, factors will give us a performance indicator that again will determine the continuum score, okay? Next is public space. In this case, the purpose is to encourage social interaction and promote the physical and mental well-being of the community by providing accessible and usable outdoor public space. In other words, livable cities. Okay? It can be measured again, so we have a calculator. In this case, we have three performance indicators. So the first one is to provide public spaces within walking distance from the users. In this case, for us, it means 480 meters. Um, also, to maximize the ratio of public space per capita, so again, the more vegetation and parts that you have, the greater score you will get here. And finally, also to make those usable here in Qatar, shading is very important. So, we have also a shading uh, coefficient that, again, the more trees and vegetation you have, this is going to be higher. And the performance indicators uh, are combined and will give us determine the uh, criterion score for the project. I brought you some um, examples here. The Ketaifan Island North, all the blue areas, all of them are public spaces. So 100% of the users within walking distance of public areas. All of them. All of them. It has 27 square meters of public uh, space per capita, which is very high. 
and 60% of the public spaces are shaded. We they get through a combination of landscaping and uh, very fancy structures. This is the linear park that I talked to you about. The landscape coverage in this case is 70%, and the shading coverage is 80%. Okay, they have divided the linear park in four zones with different, uh, with different uh, themes. This one here is nature and education, which is built next to the school. And uh, so they will take the children to see greenhouses, cactus and desert uh, uh, gardens, Quranic garden, even a mangrove area. If you're going to be here for a few days, I strongly recommend you to visit the mangroves here in Qatar and kayak to them. You wouldn't even imagine that you are in Qatar at all. It's gorgeous. And another area here, community and active, to make livable cities. So there is space for the people to exercise, yoga, sports, and uh, retail area, markets, and uh, pop-up cinemas that are very popular here in Qatar in winter. Okay, so let's go now to the encyclopedia. You can find more information here in our website. Um, so this was developed by Gord in collaboration with the Qatar Ministry of Municipality. It has information of over 800 plant species from Kuwait to Oman. Okay, all Eastern Arabia. Um, you know what they say that uh, uh, knowledge can fill a room and, does, and takes up no space. Well, that's not true. This baby takes up six volumes and over 3,300 pages. So the volumes are divided by the growth forms. The first one is about trees, like the cedar tree that you see here, which has many uses. It's uh, used for furniture, medicinal uses, and the edible fruit. Uh, number two is about shrubs, like this one here with the almond salt bush, which can take up between 15 to 20 tons of carbon per hectare once it's fully grown. Uh, number three, we have two, 3A and 3B. We have too many uh, ground covers to talk about. Like in Kansas here, for example, that study uh, shows that uh, it can be used to fight COVID-19, which is very interesting. Uh, number four is climbers and grasses, like the fountain grass here that can be spread easily in the desert and the cities can withstand the uh, contamination. And the final one is about succulents and desert plants like the Fez aloe here, which is an endangered species, it's, made, it's adapted in Qatar, and it, it's gorgeous when blooming. Here is a typical entry of the encyclopedia, okay? I chose the Phoenix Dactylifera because it's a native plant as well. So on the first page you will have the photos and the scientific name and so on, and then in the following pages you will have information on different features like uh, flowering period, conservation status, the distribution, nativity, uh, size, lifespan, cultivation and soil uh, tips and requirements. And the following two pages you will find also uh, water requirements, salinity tolerance, drought tolerance, habitat, different uh, uses, economical, landscape, environmental, medicinal, and remarks. Uh, let's have a quick, um, just time to go quick through some of them. Uh, the flowering period, which is very interesting also for the designers. Let's say that the designer wants to have like a national flag with different colors of the flowers, and they have the right flowers, the right colors, but the wrong periods, so end up having no flag whatsoever. So we have from every blooming, winter, spring, and summer period. Nativity, we divide the plants between native, Adaptive, non-native, and invasive. Uh, the size, we have uh, the height, the spread, the time of ultimate height. This can be used by the projects, okay, for the design to calculate the uh, shading coverages uh, in the parts, and they use it obviously with the business calculators, so they're seeking just a certification. Along with the canopy cover that we have divided in open, if it is less than 50%, medium, if it is ranges between 50 and 80, and Dense if it goes over 80%. Uh, we have also the growth rate, so this can be used also by the park designers to see how the park is going to develop in different years. Uh, we have slow if it's less than one foot per year, moderate, fast, and very fast if it is over three feet per year. Uh, also the lifespan, either annual, biennial, or perennial. Uh, the water requirements are ranges from high, moderate, low, and very low, 
that along with the annual rainfall requirement is going to help also to dimension properly the irrigation requirements of your park. The drought tolerance, you don't want to have plants here in Qatar with low uh, drought tolerance. We have also divided with moderate and high. And finally, the landscape uses, that ranges from those that reduce the outdoor temperature for the ground covers underneath, to those that are used for hedges, those that are used for uh, uh, ornamental in luxury homes, and those that are used for shade, provide shade in parts. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I will take any questions. Well, thank you very much. Uh, excellent presentation. And I, I really felt that it's, um, your, your, this, this is going to really stimulate change, it motivates change to a more sustainable construction. Uh, but it was reassuring to see how the extent to which you have incorporated the landscape and plants into that process. I think that's something that in, maybe in other systems and schemes we don't see so much. Uh, uh, and, then, and you have accommodated that right from uh, the beginning, and um, right. um, that's that's great to see. So thank you very much. Um, I, there was a question on the on the app, um, and we have a question from Saeed Welsby. Do you have any marketing and publicity initiatives so that maybe the citizens here can be made aware of the certification? How, how much are you promoting the, the GSAS? Uh, to the population. Yeah. Well, uh, we do have a marketing department okay, that is very active, in fact, and uh, we basically do it through events. Uh, before COVID, we used to host the Sustainability Summit in Qatar every year, for example. Okay, uh, We have been very active in the three last COPs. We have presence in COP 26, 27, and 28. And, um, uh, I'm glad to say that we are not only in Qatar, I forgot to mention this, we have project, many projects in Kuwait, for example, we have projects in Oman as well, and we have future plans also for uh, of implementation in Egypt, now recently, there is a, they are building a huge city from scratch, and uh, most probably they're going to take also this house on board, so we're moving. That, that's excellent, and uh, we have a question from Irfan Khan, what's the cost of getting GSAS certification and does it give equal weight uh, or any weight to green roofs, green walls and other engineered green areas as natural vegetation? Yeah, uh, well our fees are public in our website so they are different depending on the type of project as well so I will not go into detail because there is a, we have some table of products on the website so it's, it's very easy to access. So it's www.board.qa and all those, uh, uh, the data is there. And um, regarding those uh, architecture, I mean, the green in, architect in architecture, uh, for example, for Ecolive, which is the one for cities and uh, expo cities and, and festivals, we do have one criterion that is called sustainable, sustainable architecture. And where we look specifically to those. Okay, so if some, some of the pavilions, they come up with uh, the UAE pavilion, to give an example. Okay, it uses earth, uh, uh, compacted earth for the walls, which is one of these, uh, it doesn't have vegetation, but it's a very sustainable way to do it, okay? And um, so we do look into that in, in the equilibrium. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, uh, we have a, a one that GSAS requires lawn areas to be minimized. How does this relate to low ground cover plants that retain soil moisture, minimize dust, and support biodiversity? So, um, using vegetation to cover the ground that's not lawn, I guess. Yeah, well, when we talk about the lawn area, it's just lawn. I mean, it's the grass that takes up a lot of water. This is what we look into. Ground covers are not considered lawn in this regard. So if you have large areas of uh, lawn cover, and uh, they would not be considered as lawn, and if they are native or adaptive, it will give you also extra, extra points, extra spread. Okay, thank you. And we had a question, a question from the... Oh, thank you very much. Um, I am And I, had a, I have two questions on the encyclopedia. It's really interesting to see that. Um, out there. 
Um, one of the questions that has been, been introduced into the lesson plan in schools or universities in pop up? Um, no. Or are you thinking of that? Yeah, we are definitely thinking about that, but I, as far as I know, I don't think it is. We have a lead my colleague here. Do you know if it uh, has been? No, right? Unfortunately, not yet. Okay, uh, the next question is, have you considered digitalizing it in the form of an app where people can just take photos of a plant and they'll give them all the information that is yeah. available on the encyclopedia? Correct. And uh, the answer to that is yes. In fact, we are working on it. Okay. And I see that probably in the next coming months, I hope before summer, it will be digitalized for the device. Okay. 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 Thank you so much. And right now, what we have is the, these volumes that take a lot of space and they're very heavy. I didn't bring them with me today. Maybe tomorrow we can address that. I could bring one uh, example so you can have a look at it. Uh, but uh, so far, that's, that's what we have. We, we presented this one in the last uh, uh, book fair here in Qatar. Okay? In the, uh, in the teams. Thank you. Thank you very much.